Right here? Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> you tell me I want to be here. I'm going to come in there and I'm just going to fellowship with y'all. Hey, Miss Lily. How you doing? You're still looking. How you still looking so pretty all the time? Oh, I just, it's just God made me. The way he made me. Just like he made you. Oh, thank you, honey. Vince is the son of Brownsville radio icon Avery T. Ellison and brother of Marvin Ellison, CEO of Lowe's. It's in his DNA to take on challenges and succeed. His journey has led him to become a disciple of unflinching truth, always prepared to combat the lies that have been woven into the very fabric of our lives. He accepts that he has been given wisdom to see behind the facade and present unfiltered truths so that all who hear him can see as he does. He has authored three, or really four, gonna be, of best-selling books. The three is here, we don't have the fourth. Uh, produced a documentary, spoken at countless venues across the country and has been featured on several political television shows. Let's welcome Vince Everett Ellison. Miss Lovelace, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. What a beautiful lady. Give Miss Lovelace another hand. Thank you. Thank you so much for your invitation. I'm so happy to be here in Jackson, Tennessee. This is home to me. I have so many relatives and friends and I spent so much time here in Jackson, it's home. I turned around and I was reminded of how much home it was. Turned around and my reverend is here, my pastor, Rastin Nathaniel Vaughn, stand up and hear him and his wife. Y'all stand up, y'all oh, that's his daughter. Stand up honey, yeah. Deliverance House of Prayer. Known in my whole, I mean when I say my whole life, my whole life. His mother and my grandmother were sisters. That's how close we are. His, 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 his uh, grandfather was my great-grandfather. And we, we loved him, we called him, he called him granddaddy, we called him big daddy. <laughs> That's how close I am to Jackson, Tennessee. My grandmother, my mother had seven children. My grandmother had 16 children. My great-grandmother had 14 children. And I'm thinking probably half the people in here probably get some kin to me. <laughs> we call them that. <laughs> but this is home. And I enjoy coming home because when you're home, you know who your people are. You understand their mores and their values. You know, Ronald Reagan told this joke. It's so funny. Ronald Reagan said that uh, a preacher and a politician both died and they both went to heaven. And they met St. Peter, and St. Peter was taking them around heaven, telling, showing them where they were going to live. They took, went to the preacher's house first, and they went to the preacher, and the St. Peter said, Preacher, this is your home. It was a humble home. Two rooms, bedroom, kitchen, bathroom, a cot for the preacher to sleep in. The preacher was very happy. He said, Thank you, St. Peter. Thank you. God bless. And St. Peter said, Politician, let me show you your home. Well, they get to the driveway, and there's a gate there, and the golden gate opens up, and there are pillars, and there's a manicured lawn, and there's this great big mansion there, and there are fountains, and there are attendants, and there are butlers, and there are maids, and they walk in, and there are rooms, and there's food everywhere, and St. Peter says, politician, this is your home. Politician looks at St. Peter and said, St. Peter, I'm a little confused here. Why do I get this big mansion? And the preacher gets this little small house. Why the discrepancy? He said, well, St. Peter said, well, politician, you got to understand how we do things here. He said, we got a whole lot of preachers, but well, you're the first politician that ever made it. <laughs> That's Ronald Reagan. <laughs> you got to love it, right? You got to love it. <laughs> Y'all, one of the things we got to talk about today the song that was being sang earlier about the choir that was done so very, very well. And I want to applaud y'all for it. It's beautiful. We got to bring our country back. 
I was so happy last night to meet a man, a great Southern gentleman, Dr. Freeman. Uh, met him last night. We may have talked 10 or 15 minutes, but left. You know, it was like when the disciples talked to Jesus after he had been resurrected and the people, and they didn't know who he was. And they said, who was that man? And they said, we don't know, but then our hearts burn within us. So that's why I wasn't going to talk to Dr. Freeman last night. Just a man that had, uh, just in, in the short time that I met him, told me about his time in Thailand as a missionary, bringing people to Christ. And, I'm, and when you think about that in real time, you say, okay, you actually went into the jungles of Thailand. It's been 10 years. People trying to kill you, disease, uh, uh, primitives. To bring Jesus Christ to people. Yes, I did. All you can do is sit back and say, wow. 91 years old, still got his faculty, still getting around, still just a good man. And you look at him and you say, this is what a life serving God, being a good man. This is what it does for you. He still has that spark. And I'm glad to count you as a friend, Dr. Freeman. Thank you so very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, April Chapman is here. She's, uh, she's taking over management of my affairs when it comes down to my documentaries and, and my books and everything. Uh, April met Dr. Freeman last night, and I think she's here tonight because I think she has a crush on Dr. Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Freeman, you watch her, okay? Keep, you keep your eyes on her. You got to watch her. <laughs> no, she's great. They're doing a documentary. I told them that I was coming here. And I was just mentioning it in passing. And they said, we're coming. And I said, well, I'm not asking you guys to come. They said, no, we're coming. We want, we've heard about your town. We've heard about where you live. We want to be there to document these people. We're coming. Is that my auntie? Hey, baby girl! <laughs> I just say, hey, that's nice. Hey, baby. Lord, these are my people. Thank you so much, honey, for coming. Y'all, this is my mother's sister. Uh, and she's beautiful. I always have been. Hey, Nisa, and that's my, and that's my, that's my cousin. Told y'all I was home. Oh, uh, thank you, honey, for coming out. Oh, Lord, and you know what? My, my sister is here, Virginia is here, my daughter is here, and my and my and my grandson is here. Y'all stand up and wave at the crowd. Yeah, yeah, we, 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 yeah. I called them before y'all came in. Unless you're pointing at somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, yeah, y'all, oh, yeah. Can't miss it. <laughs> y'all, we're family. We're home. And the one thing that I know about this area, because I walk so easily between these two worlds, is that we believe the same thing. It's not much difference in us when you talk about our love of Jesus Christ, our love of God. Our love of fellow men, it's no different. And we love one another. I look around. I have this beautiful stepmother, the best stepmother in the history of the world. Miss Gwen is here. Miss Gwen, please stand up and let somebody see how pretty you are and why my daddy married you. We're here tonight. We're family. And the choir song is sung about us taking America back. America's home. It's home. This is where we live. And we are this close to losing it all. This is what we do. And this is not a, it's not a bad thing. We work for a living. We take care of our families. We help them with their homework, our children. We do charity work. And there's so much noise out there now. You know, when we were younger, what, we had three channels on the television? We all watched the same thing. You know, Daddy would tell us when we would sit back to watch the television, and if we started arguing, he said, y'all better agree, I'm going to turn it off. <laughs> and we had to sit back, and we had to agree on what to watch. Now every child got his own device with limitless stuff to watch. And we don't know what they're seeing. We don't know who's influencing them. And then we turn around. And our children, we don't even know them. They're gone. It started when we believed at one time, and we were correct to believe this, 
that our schools and our teachers passed on our values to our children. When we were smaller, they did. We knew them, they were our neighbors, we understood what they taught, we understood what they did. This has changed. It's completely changed. We don't know what they're teaching them. We don't know what they're learning. We have to get control of this and fast. I woke up one day and I turned on the television and I saw men in dresses and drag queens actually standing up shaking their behinds and our children's faces and I said, what is this? Where did this come from? How did this happen? Actually, men in dresses dancing in front of small children. We find out that in the state of Tennessee that Vanderbilt Hospital was doing sex change operations on children. The Tennessee legislature changes it and then the Biden administration takes Tennessee to court, the Supreme Court, to demand that there be no age limit on sex change operations to children. How do you get here? You get to a point where you can abort a child up to the day that it is born. This is government policy. We look around and there are men in dresses in Washington, D.C. sashaying around representing the government of the United States of America in front of the world. And I ain't just talking about, you know, sometimes you look like a tra transgender and they can confuse you. I'm talking about an ugly man in a dress. <laughs> ain't no doubt he's a man in a dress. <laughs> and he's going to stand up there with an attitude and tell you to call him ma'am, and if not, he's going to try to get you fired from your job. And instead of us saying, oh, man, you better get out of my face, we say, okay, we'll do it to keep the paycheck. We've allowed a culture where we allow demented men in dresses to go into the bathrooms with our wives and our children, with our daughters, and watch them urinate. And we all can remember, remember time, if you called a man in a bathroom with your wife and your children, you had carte blanche to just beat him down. And the police will come in and take him to jail. Now they'll take you to jail. We've gotten a culture where they're trying to make it legal for a man as big as me to swim against or do sports against a little girl that's 120 pounds. And if the daddy come up and say something about it, they put the daddy in jail. You better shut up and let this man do this to your wife and your daughter. And we allow it? They've taken it too far. In our, in our Bible, after Elijah had um, killed all the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Jezebel sent him a letter to tell them that she was going to kill him. And Elijah took out and running. Passed out in exhaustion, told God, Lord, go ahead and kill me, because if Jezebel get hold to me, it's just going to be, it's going to be real bad for me. Just take me out. I'm the only prophet that you have in Jerusalem. God told Elijah, Elijah, I have 7,000 men in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem never bowed a knee to Baal. No, kiss his lips. Elijah didn't know who they are. They had not been activated. I believe we got those types of men here in America. It's more than 7,000. They have never bowed the knee to this foolishness. Refused to bow to it. Now you need time for you to be activated. You've been asleep too long. And see, you can walk around and play with a sleeping uh, a lion for a long time while he's asleep. But when he wake up, yeah, he's going to make you back down. And it's time for the lion and us to wake up. It's time for the Christian men and women to stop fighting over foolishness. You don't fight in a burning house. You come together and say, we are going to stop fighting until this fire is out. Then we can start arguing about stupid stuff, like flags and monuments and foolishness like that. But right now, they're trying to kill our children. And they got us fighting over foolishness. Foolishness. Mao Zedong and Shishak and Chiang and Kai-shek was in a civil war in China, fighting, killing, trying to kill one another. Japan took advantage of their fighting and invaded China. Mao had Chiang Kai-shek cornered, could have killed him. 
And he told Shane, no, we got to join forces and stop this civil war. And we got to fight the Japanese right now. And when we get them out of China, we might can start our fight back. But right now, we got to run them out of our country because they are using our division to destroy our, destroy our nation. Shane Kai-shek and Mao came together and ran the Japanese out, started the Civil War back, and Mao beat it. But they got the Japanese out of their country first. It is time for Christians to set aside their differences, come together and form a fist, and beat these devils back. They're not coming, they're here. And they're not playing. Because just in case you had noticed, you check the census and you will find out America's dying. I'm not talking about figuratively, I'm talking about literally. We have to have a 2.1 reproduction rate in order to stay where we are, stay constant. 2.1, that means every couple has two children, and America stays where it is. To grow, we need more than that, but to stay where we are, we need to be at 2.1. Guess where we are, y'all? We're at 1.6. And we've been there for almost 10 years now. It's a death spiral. You know when it started? When the Supreme Court passes, passed Arborville versus Hodges, the, the, the uh, case that, uh, that uh, made gay marriage legal? And they took something that God has sanctified and they said, no, we are going to now rename it into what we want it to be. And we allowed it. They said, mm, we can do that. All right, now we can redefine, since we redefine marriage, let's redefine what a man and a woman is. For since God made Adam, a man had an XY chromosome and a woman had an XX chromosome. There was always a definition of man and a woman. And then you know what? They said, no, that's not it anymore. What is a man and a woman? Whatever we say it is. We allowed it. They tell us they can control the weather. <laughs> Climate change. Y'all give us enough money, we can control hurricanes and tornadoes. And we said, show up. <laughs> And I was, are you that stupid? And they're selling it to the American people. And people, the climate change calls her climate change. Climate. I mean, you can't control the weather. They've been telling that lie since the beginning of time. <laughs> and we're falling for it again. People, this is insanity. It's not new. Countries have been taken over by crazy people. Ever since the beginning of the time, Nero took over Rome. Rome. Caligula took over Rome, named his horse as one of the consuls. Destroyed the country. Crazy. Hitler took over Germany. Crazy. Crazy. And here's the thing about crazy people. Crazy people think sane people are crazy. They think people with sense are crazy. So what does a crazy person do? They surround themselves with people like them, other crazy people. And then you get a bunch of crazy people running a country with a with $7 trillion budget, doing crazy stuff. And we're sitting back as a nation watching this insanity around us, and if nobody starts talking about it, you start thinking you crazy. Oh, there's something wrong with you if you only accept a drag queen shaking his mind in your child face. You don't want crazy. You don't want crazy if you uh, 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 don't let nobody keep you from praying to your God where you want to pray. You don't want crazy if you don't let them take your gun away because of what somebody else did. He killed the person. Well, Vince, I'm going to take your gun because he killed somebody. Collective punishment. You're crazy if you want your child to have a Bible Christian-based education. You're the one that's crazy now. It's like in the, in, the, in the book, in the great movie, it was Moby Dick. Ahab, the captain, has lost, had lost his mind because Moby Dick had taken his leg and he had conned the fishing men of the Pequod to go after the white whale to help him kill him. He wanted to kill Moby Dick. Revenge was on his mind. But he had to get them to agree. Ahab gives this rip-roaring speech. He was crazy, but he was charismatic. And he got all these guys to start screaming, death to Moby Dick, death to Moby Dick, death to Moby Dick. And the only guy that kept his head was the second in command. His name was uh, Starbuck. And Starbuck looked around and he said, 
I see a man, man, but get more mad men. What has happened to the men of the Pequot for? No, not one of you. Salah! And I say that about America. I see a madman, but get more madmen. I look around, I see madness all around me. And I'm saying, what has happened to the men of America? What's happened to the boys of D-Day? They saw this madness in Germany and said, we're going to stop it. They saw this madness in Japan and said, we're going to stop it. They saw the madness of communism. They said that God doesn't exist. And we said, you can't bring this over here. We stopped it. And now we stopped the madness. Now the madness has taken us over. We become what we said we were going to stop. We have a foreign policy now that tells nations, unless you kill your children in the womb, you can get no help from the United States of America. Sorry, y'all. Getting a little excited here. We have a foreign policy that says, unless you accept men marrying men and women marrying women, you can get no help from the United States of America. We have a foreign policy that says that if you do not agree that men can control the weather, you're not going to get any help from the United States of America. We started transporting insanity and anti-Christian bigotry all over the world. The United States of America is being called satanic by other nations in the world and an anti-Christian nation. And they look at us and say, look at them, they're dying. They're dying. China found out it was dying, they're trying to reverse it. Putting together all kinds of programs to try to reverse it. Vladimir Putin and Russia said the same thing. Y'all ain't bringing that LGBTQ transgender mess over here. Why? We're dying. We got to turn it back. What America said, full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. Bill Clinton the other day let it slip. He said, we're beyond the rate of sustaining our population. We're at 1.6. So now we have to bring in the illegals to replace you. He admitted, you're being replaced. He didn't say we need to stop killing our children. We need to stop the death spiral. No, you're being replaced. You know why? You think a little bit too much of yourselves. You're Americans. Y'all, this is not new. What did Pharaoh say when he found out the children of Israel was having too many children? If the girl child comes, let her live. But if the boy child comes, kill him! Kill him! He told the midwife to kill him. Is that new? Hitler didn't like the Jews, what did he do? Kill them! Replace them! Put them in ovens! Stalin didn't like the kulaks, what did he do? Kill them! Replace them! Governments have always replaced the citizens that they find too troublesome and expendable. We're being replaced. We're getting to a point where God is going to take his hands off of this country. Now what must we do? We as Christians must come together as one. All races, all creeds, Jesus' last prayer before we went to the cross was a prayer of unity for us to be together. And then he commanded that we love one another. That we love one another. But we have a side that says, no justice, no peace. When Jesus Christ said, my peace I leave with you. See how contradictory that is? We have a side that says that you're dreaming about a day that you will not be judged by the color of your skin. When Jesus Christ says you're not supposed to be concerned about how you're viewed by man. I'm concerned about how you view me. I love you. Our Bible is replete with instructions for us not to be concerned about how we're viewed by man. He said people that follow man or, or, or try to please man set a trap for themselves. We're dreaming about a day that we'll be accepted by men. Can man stop anything that Jesus Christ has preordained for you? That's the question. Can he? Then why do we ask the question? Why are we marching? We beg. 
government. When Jesus Christ has told you, I got you. I'm your father. Do you doubt that I'll do good to you? But instead, marching, fighting, begging. And what has happened? America's dying. We're dying. We have to go back to what our Bible says. It's binary. There is no flaw in the gospel of Jesus Christ. None whatsoever. Love one another. Be good to one another. Show forbearance to one another. Because as you deal with a government that is making it illegal for you to pray to your God, illegal, no, you can't pray to him unless you are in your church or behind the doors of your home. And then they're going to tell you, and they're trying to get this right now, that you have no right to even teach your religion to your children. Yes. You can pray to yourself. Don't pray to that child. People, it's time for us to wake up. I'm here to tell you that we've been fighting each other in a burning house. We have to let the hatred go. We have to let the, the anger go. I like to use this story in my closing. Genesis 4, and I read through my Bible my whole life, and this went straight over my head until about five years ago. And I was reading it. It's the story of Cain and Abel. We all know the story. Cain was angry with his brother Abel because God had rejected Cain's offering, but he had accepted Abel's. It was interesting that Cain wasn't angry at God for rejecting his offering. He was angry at Abel because Abel had done better. Interesting. So angry that he was contemplating killing his own brother. Mad at his brother, because his brother was doing better than he was. God knew how the human mind was wired up, and he went and he talked to his grandson. It was Adam's son, and he said, he wanted to give him insight. He wanted to help him. He said, Cain, why are you angry? And here was the enlightening statement. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin waits at the door to master you, but you must master it. Listen, y'all, if you do well, will you not be accepted? My father was born on a cotton plantation, Haywood County, Tennessee. He was um, abandoned by his mother and his father at six weeks old, at six weeks old. Picked cotton, sharecropped. When I was born, I asked him what I was doing when I was born. He said, I was sharecropping and washing cars take care of his family. Daddy aspired. Got a job working for Al Ross on a debit route, collecting money. Black and white people were told poor back then we didn't have checking accounts. So if you had a life insurance policy, you had to get somebody to go and collect the money. And Daddy was an honest man, and he went on a debit route, collecting money for Al Ross, and he learned the insurance business, and he started selling insurance. And Daddy and Mama bought us out of poverty. Hard work. They aspired in America. They didn't believe what they'd been told about you can't make it in America if you're black. They refused to believe it. And they bought us out of the cotton field. They bought a brand new house. Daddy's been in that house 52 years now. Paid it off. And then we started the Ellison Family Gospel Single Group going around singing good gospel music all over the country. And when I think about that statement, if you do well, will you not be accepted? I think about my dad, because now at 81 years old, when they were advertising the fact that I was coming to Brownsville, Tennessee, they still say, the son of Ivory T. Ellison. Wherever I go, I'm still Ivory T's boy. <laughs> Has a great name in the community. I was talking on the radio this morning, Carlton Beards. They 15 minutes before the show, for the first 15 minutes, he talked about daddy. Went to a, a luncheon today, the Presbyterian Church. Everybody wanted to talk about my father. If you do well, will you not be accepted? My brother Marvin did well. My sister Virginia did well. Pastor Vaughn did well. So all this color mess is a lie. You don't get much blacker than me and Nathan Bond. <laughs> 
If you was going to keep a brother down because of the color of his skin, me and that brother wouldn't have a chance. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Anybody that holds that against you is insane. And you don't need his company anyway. You will not find any sane American that will look at you and say, because you're black or because you're white, I'm not going to help you. Solely because of that. That is a lie. And they're selling that lie all over this nation to young people before they are old enough to even come out of their parents' home. They're defeated. I can't make it. They celebrate this hip-hop culture. Sex, violence, materialism. I did a podcast this past week, read the name of 77 of these little rappers that have been murdered. They said the odds of, a, 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 of one of these young hip-hop guys getting murdered is 35 times higher than the average American. 35 times. And yet they elevate this culture. They invite him to the White House. Invite him to the Super Bowl. Got him on commercials. Had Cardi B at one of the functions just shaking. Like it's 29 degrees below zero, just shaking. And what is this about? Had one rapper on there been arrested 15, 20 times. He said, why are you elevating these people? Sex, violence, materialism, all they talk about the money they got, the people they shot, the women they mistreated. And instead of us ostracizing these people and setting them aside where they're supposed to be, they elevate them. Why would you do such a thing? It's a death cult. And the easiest thing in the world, just like what Ronald Reagan did, everybody wanted to play with the Soviet Union, and they wanted to play with the Soviet Union, and Ronald Reagan said, they're an evil empire. They're evil. It's binary. We're good, they're evil, that's it, we're going to take them out. Abraham Lincoln, people have been playing around with slavery for years. He said, it is evil, we're going to stop it. People were placating, playing with Hitler. Churchill, he's evil, he's got to go. We have to stop being afraid of calling these people who they are. When Jesus Christ came into the temple, did he miss words? Don't y'all worry about the Romans. Your problem is those jokers right over there. Your Sadducees and your Pharisees, liars, hypocrites, generations of vipers. They're liars and they're, 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 they're just like their father, the devil. He called them exactly who they were. And I'm tired of playing with these people. I confront them every day and I dare them to come confront me back. They stick in my nostrils. I hold them in utter contempt. I've gotten on TV and I've dared them to come and confront me. I said, you cannot stand in my face. I will not bow down or accept evil in my presence. I refuse. You come to me with your pants sagging, you gonna pull them up, I'm gonna deal with you. You ain't gonna come to me talking about I'm a man in a dress, you gotta call me ma'am. I'm gonna show you something. We have to start giving the social pressure again to turn this foolishness back. Let, if I, let my grandson walk in there talking about I'm going to get some tats on my face. I said, no, no, you don't get this tat on your face. <laughs> well, I ain't going to argue with you. I'm not going to argue with you. Children come in telling parents what they're going to do. Man, I can't even imagine that in my house. My daddy was a robot. Binary. If you did it, you were fine. If you didn't, you were in trouble. And a lot of it. There wasn't no gray area in there. Did you do it? No, sir. Come on. We need to start being that again, y'all. To not call a liar a liar is wrong. To not call a pervert, a pervert is wrong. Dude, you are a pervert. James A. Garfield said that a brave man looks the devil in the eye and calls him a devil. Confront him. Look him in the eye. Tell him exactly who he is. He says, I don't care if you like it. 
I'm ready to defend my ground. I've drawn the line. Cross it if you want to. And I'm gonna finish this, I'm gonna finish my talk with this. Christianity is not a religion of nonviolence. Christianity is a religion of non-aggression. That means if you don't bother me, I don't bother you. Jesus Christ was not a pinata. He didn't walk around this earth having people beat him up, break his legs, and beat him like he's a dog. Nobody touched him until his time had come. He taught Pilate, Pilate's have your life in my hands. And no, you don't, don't get this twisted. I give up my life. And when I want it, I take it back. You ain't taking nothing from me. Now let's get this over with. So no, there's no virtue in a man allowing another man to come into his, his house and rape his wife and his children. And say, so, well, I'm a Christian, I can't do nothing. So virtue in a man, I'm walking down the street, I see a three-year-old girl getting raped in a car, and I say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian man, I can't do nothing. My job is to grab the guy, whoop him till he stops fighting, hold him for the police, and turn him over. My job is to look at you and say, I will not be held responsible for your foolishness, for your laziness, for your refusal to stand up and be a man. I will not live in condemnation for you. If you want a good job, I help you get one. If you want a good preacher, I help you find one. If you need to go to a doctor, I'll help you and I'll send you to one. Short of that, you are not going to harm me or mine. And if you try to take anything from me or try to hurt me, I got two things that'll get you off of me. And that is Jesus and my 38. You better not try me. So with that, as Americans, with that, as Christians, let us stand firm and remember where we came from. The founders of our nation were black and white. Don't let nobody fool you and believe that the founding fathers were all white men. They signed the document. The people that did the fighting were the black and the white men. Right. You understand that? Yeah. Yes. At your town, when Alexander Hamilton George told George Washington, I got to fight. And George Washington wanted to make sure that he was safe because he was his best man. He said, I'm going to give you my best regiment to go and fight with. Who was George Washington's best reg regiment? It was the first Rhode Island. Who were they? They were a regiment of black men. The best group in the whole American Revolution was a regiment of black men. Hamilton wanted to sneak up on the guys at night, so he said, I don't want you to fire your gun, so fix bayonets. They ran up on the British with nothing but bayonets and killed them all. And the next day, the British surrendered. They want to lie to you and take away your birthright. The American, during, during the Civil War, after the Emancipation Proclamation, a lot of whites up north said, we're not fighting any longer. Frederick Douglass told Abraham Lincoln, you better call out the free black men up here. Lincoln said, do you think they'll fight? He said, I know they will. He put out the clarion call. 87% of the free black men up north joined the Union Army. Over 200,000. The United States of America was done. Nobody else was going to volunteer. Those 200,000 black men joined the army and they saved the United States of America. They won the war for the Union. The nation would not exist without those men. That is a fact. This is not hyperbole. Abraham Lincoln said these men saved this nation. We own that. That's our birthright. And then you allow an illegal to come here and he makes more money in one year than a black man has been of 20 generations. And we allow it. Our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, said this. That we had a right to leave King George. And he said, you're not our sovereign. He said, yes, I am. He said, no, God is our sovereign. They had read the works of John Locke. And John Locke said that we have these rights called unalienable rights. What are unalienable rights? Unalienable rights are rights given you by God. These rights are so ingrained in you that they, that they are irrevocable. They are non-transferable. They are unsellable. These are yours. And they told King George, you are violating these rights and you have no right to do so because they were given us by God. King George said, I'm over God, I'm your sovereign. They said, we're gonna show you, King George. 
And they signed a Declaration of Independence that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that if any government comes to try to, uh, and tries to not and try to take over these rights, we are to eliminate that government and replace it with one that will secure it. And at the end, this is what they said, before we be slaves, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And went out and whooped his behind. <laughs> and then when they put together the, the document forming this government, they had completed it. And they sent it to Virginia. And Virginia said, no, you got to add one thing. They said, what? We want a bill of rights, unalienable rights, rights given to us by God that you can never, ever touch. Write them down. It's a guarantee between us and our government that they will never touch these rights. Why? God gave them to us. Not you. God. If you ever try to touch them, we will kill you all. That's the United States of America. That's the concept of it. These are ours. God gave them to us. You touch us, we'll kill you. Unalienable rights given us by God. And guess what we've done? We've created a public education system where his name can't be mentioned. Now, how are these children supposed to learn about these rights? Rights given by God, but you can't mention God. How are they supposed to learn about these rights? They don't. How do you create a government system where the government is based upon rights given you by God, but then you say God cannot be mentioned? See, when I talk about insanity, while we're losing it, that we've allowed this, that they're taking our money to turn our children against us, We are not victims, we are participants in our own destruction. And we must say our tolerance is over, never again. This stops here! So we want to rededicate ourselves to the frowning principles. Number one is our God. He's always first. We formed our country around him. Rededicate ourselves to that, to going back to our Bible, this binary concept of right and wrong. What did Jesus say? That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, I fought these evil people most of my adult life. I fought them in the halls of Congress. I fought them on the streets of America. I fought them in the prisons. I'll fight them everywhere I find them. I will fight them until hell freezes over. And when hell freezes over, I'll fight them on ice. Thank you, good night. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Y'all gonna have me moving back home. Thank y'all so much.